praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing today? Hope everybody is doing well in the wonderful name of Jesus. Um, excited to be here once again. Um, just got through hearing a, a, a tremendous message uh, through uh, Re Restoration Revival Fellowship uh, out of India, but the uh, apostle from the United Kingdom, uh, Apostle Lloyd Denny, excuse me while I adjust this camera here. And uh, so anyway, enjoyed the fellowship, even though uh, fellowship is a little different now compared to how normally church is. Uh, but uh, we're still excited nonetheless because we know that God is, he's still on the throne, amen. Today, I actually want to spend some time and I, I want to allow some people to kind of come on board. But uh, those that are not on board just yet, I know that they'll be able to watch later on. So with all of that said, I want to talk to you a little bit about what God has been dealing with me on. And what he's been dealing with me on is warfare, is going to battle with the enemy. Uh, there's a lot going on right now and has always, there's always been a lot going on. Whether or not we know about it, there's always been a lot that's going on. But now with the age of, um, you know, with the internet and everything, there's even more so things that are going on that we can find out and know more about. And so uh, with that said, what we want to do is we want to be able to, to fight effectively. And when we fight effectively, what has to happen is we have to be able to go to war. Nobody goes to war uh, and is effective in war if what they're doing there's no plan to it. And with God, there's a certain plan and there's certain things that he is, he is wanting from us. And I wanted to do this today and it's about meeting God at the wine press. And uh, in meeting God at the wine press, there's, there's something supernatural. And we're gonna go over Gideon, how Gideon actually was used of God. And guess what, Gideon, he actually had some of the same questions that people have today. And it's, it's Gideon, the story that's behind Gideon, is one that actually relates to things that are going on today where people themselves are wondering, where is God at? You know, how come he hasn't done things? Well, we've heard about his miracles. We've heard about these things, but where is he at? Gideon was in the same situation and then Gideon used him. So with that said today, I want you to get your Bibles out. Go to Judges chapter six and uh, look in verse 11, Judges six and 11. So we got to meet God at the wine press. And while you get your Bibles out and, and go to Judges chapter 6, go to verse 11. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. My gracious God, Lord, we just thank you. We love you. We give you all the honor, the glory. Lord, there's none that compare with you. There are none that is like you, Lord. You are God and God alone. There is no other king. There's no other God. There's none that can stand before you. Matter of fact, all, knee, all knees will eventually kneel before you and proclaim that you are God. Whether they do it now or they do it later, it doesn't matter. They will do it. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would anoint these lips of clay. Lord, that you would just move within me, Lord. Let your words come forth. Let me be silent, Lord. And Lord, let me give you all the honor and the glory. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So go to Judges chapter 6, verse 11. I want you to see this. It says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abiezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Now, I want you to know something here that's very interesting is, uh, well, one thing that you may gather, you say, well, Ophrah, Ophrah, that sounds kind of like Oprah. Well, actually, this is where her name comes from. They just took the H out. Uh, but they were at this location called Ophrah. And in this location, he was under an oak tree. And look what it says. It says that the son of Gideon, he was threshing wheat by the wine press. And it says uh, to hide it from the Midianites. Well, he's, he's meeting the angel of the Lord, which is a representative of God at this location. Why is he hiding? Why is this? Well, you have to read a little bit earlier in this chapter. And so I want you to see something for me. Go to, go to verse 1, chapter 6 and verse 1 of Judges, same chapter. Watch what it says here. It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian, into, into the hand of Midian seven years. So seven years, the Midianites 
came and they, they, they wore them out. Watch what they did. It says, And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown, so when they went and planted their crops, that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till... Uh, Till thou come unto Gaza, left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. Wow. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers. Uh, it says, for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Now, seven years go, and then finally they get this idea, we need to cry out to God. They're crying out to God. Why? Because they're being impoverished. They can't live. The Midianites have a hand on them. Jacob, you do me a favor. You'll turn that, that fan on for me right there. Uh, so anyway, thank you, sir. And uh, so what happens here is the Midianites have come in. They have had their way with the Israelites. They, and why? They were, they were given into the hands of the Midianites because guess what? They had did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, with this said, here's, here's Gideon. He's at a wine press. And at the wine press, what is he doing? It says he's threshing wheat. He's, he's hiding what he's doing because he's threshing wheat. What's interesting is while he's here under this tree, he is impoverished. His family being Israelites, they, they have been worshiping another god. They've been worshiping Baal, Baal. And with this said, they've done evil in the sight of God. They don't even look to God as their, as their maker, as the one who uh, brought them out of, of Egypt. There was all these miraculous things that had taken place with the Israelites. But they did not believe. Why? It's, the same. it's no different today. Let me tell you why it's no different today. I'm going to tell you why. Because there's a lot of people today that because they haven't seen the hand of God, and some have seen the hand of God, they don't believe. Why? Why is it? How is it possible that you can see the hand of God and then not believe? Well, in this case, it had been years since these things had happened. And Gideon is here. And what is Gideon doing? He's threshing wheat. Now, here's some, some key things. Let's go back to verse 11. I want you to, well, let's keep reading where we were at. Let's go back in verse 7. I want you to see they, they've been impoverished by God. Watch this. Now watch what's going to happen in verse 7. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. Notice the first reason they're crying out to God is not because of their sin. The reason they're crying out is because of the affliction that sin has brought. They've done evil in the sight of God. And what they're doing right now is they're not crying out to God in repentance. For what? We're wrong. They're not doing that. They are crying out to God because of the affliction that they're experiencing. It says, uh, because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, now watch what the prophet says. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Wow. So they're not crying to God because of their wrongdoing. They're crying out to God because of their affliction. You know, many people today, it's the same thing. They don't cry out to God because they look in their lives and say, you know, there's certain things going on in my life and I need to change them. Instead, they cry about the affliction. Maybe they're impoverished. Maybe they, they're having trouble financially. Maybe, maybe they have disease and sickness and things have affected them. Now, am I saying that all... Uh, uh, Sin and everything is as a result of sickness in your life. No, I'm not saying that at all. We know that God can use. It's like the blind man. He said, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, said, whose sin caused him to be born blind? He said, neither. But this was just so the glory of God could be seen. I'm not saying that. But there is plenty of sickness. Matter of fact, in the first two chapters of Genesis, there's no sickness or disease ever mentioned. 
And then after sin enters, guess what comes into this world? Disease, sickness, and death. So with that said, here it is, God saying, you didn't believe my word. I, I delivered you out of Egypt and you do not believe who I am. You're in another land that's, that's got gods, but you are not coming to me. Now, you got, I'm going to just tell you this real quick. I just last Sunday, I went to visit uh, a friend of mine, a brother in Christ. And as I was going, I, I felt the Lord said, go, I want you to go. And when I went, when I pulled up in front of that house, God spoke something to me that I'll never be able to, I mean, it, it shook me. He said, you have become one with my word, now use it. And I was like, oh, I mean, it shook me. To, I mean, literally, I trembled. What does he mean by that? If you, if you know the, the, the whole ideal of the gospel, then you know something very peculiar. When, when two people get married, what happens? The two become one flesh. This is part of, a, this is part of the, the uh, visual that we get, which is about the gospel. The two, when they get married, the two become one flesh. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, it says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Guess what? It was just like it was with Adam and Eve. Guess what? Eve was brought to Adam after the surgery, after the rib was taken. Eve was brought. Adam was made from the dust. He wasn't made from the dust. She was made from his rib. Same thing, Jesus on the cross. I don't have time to re-preach this right now. I'm just gonna give you the synopsis. Christ on the cross, where was he stabbed? In the side, he was pierced in the side. Blood and water flowed. This is all part of, of being born again. You gotta be born again of the water and the spirit. The blood is repentance when we have to die because we're being born again. But guess what? Then what Christ was bringing his bride back to him so that we could become one. But we can't become one with God because sin has its effect in our life. So we become one flesh. Well, what flesh is it that we become? We become what? The word that was made. For. Guess what? This physical body is here still. This is why there was circumcision, a cutting away of the flesh and throwing it away. But then what was that to do? It was to show us that there was one that was coming whose seed, which is the word of God, was going to do what? It was coming to save us. See, God was a spirit. He's always been a spirit. And as a spirit, he couldn't save us because you need to have blood to pay for sin. This is why this was, this is why it's called a great mystery of God coming in the flesh. First Timothy 3, 16, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Why was he manifest in the flesh? Because he was coming to save us, you and I. How? Because he had been a spirit, but now he manifests himself in a body. The one true and living God. There's only one God. He comes in the flesh, says in John 1, he came to his own, his own didn't know him not, they, they didn't know him, his own what, his own creation, they didn't know who he was. He shows up, he's got blood, and now that he has his blood, he's coming to make sacrifice for us. Matter of fact, what else did he bring when he came to this earth? He brought a name. He brought the name, as it says in Acts, that there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. What name was that? Jesus and this name Jesus is now being fought against. Even in the gospel, as simple as the gospel is, as far as repenting, being baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, guess what? And receiving the Holy Ghost, people fight against even the baptism in the name of Jesus. No, 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 see, see, there's, 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 no, there's more than one, no. Jesus said, I, who was it that was saying it? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so people will fight against it. That's okay, they need revelation. This is part of the warfare that we need to be in. We have got to believe the word of God. So here, when it came down to this, when it came down to this, when, when Gideon and, and the Israelites, they had been impoverished by the Midianites. And because of their affliction, they're coming to God. It's not because, guess what? They, they see themselves and say, you know what, man, we have done wrong. No, no, no. So God sends a prophet when they begin to pray. And what does the prophet say? He tells them that what? I delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians. And I told you, you're dwelling in this, this land here with these, these foreign gods, this, the gods of the Amorites. And guess what? But you haven't believed me. That's a big problem. That's a problem today. 
You know what? There are people today that are not sharing their faith with people because they don't really believe the faith that they have. See, you, what, what it is is you've got religiosity. You've got, you've got religion, but you don't have salvation. Salvation is as a result of coming into a covenant relationship with God. He delivered you out of sin and death, and now what is he expecting from you? To believe. If you believe that he's delivered you out of sin and death, you've obeyed the gospel, you've repented, you've been baptized in the name of Jesus, you've received the Holy Ghost, you believe, then, he, then what is stopping you now from going out and sharing the word of God with people? Some of you can share all kinds of things with people, but are you too scared to share with people the gospel? And guess what? If that's the case, do you realize God's not pleased with you? There's no, he's not pleased with you. So watch this. This is why the message is entitled, Meeting God at the Wine Press. So I want you to look at this in verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord, sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abiezrite, and his son, Gideon, threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Now, what's interesting is he's at a wine press. He's near a wine press, and he's threshing wheat. Two things we need to know. Number one, the wine press... Uh, in Isaiah, let me get this real quick. Isaiah 63, I want you to see something. Isaiah chapter 63, we'll look in verse uh, 1. It says, Who is this that cometh from Edom? This is a prophetic statement of God. Watch this. With, with dyed garments from Bozrah. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness, it says, of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the winepress? Watch this. Look what, this is what God's saying. I have trodden the winepress alone and of the people. There was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm, this is God, prophetically speaking, my own arm, it says, brought salvation unto me, and my fury, is it upheld me. And I will tread the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Who was this going to be coming and treading the wine press alone? It was God himself and his garment. Now, we got to pay attention to this, because this is going to come back full circle in the message that I'm teaching you today. His garments were dyed red. See, when, here's something that's very interesting. When they, would, when they made wine, watch this, they had a big vat, and they would, they would be bringing all the grapes and putting the grapes in. And God said that he tread in the wine press all by himself. So you know what they would do? They would literally take their feet. They would get in, and they would begin to walk and smash the grapes. And you just hope that everybody had clean feet, whoever was making your wine, right? Just a joke. Watch this. But God himself, he's coming, and what does he do? He was treading the grapes, and he said, I did it all by myself. Now, what's interesting about the wine press and how they did this was there was a couple of things you need to know about how wine is made. First off, inside the grape, it's the sweet juice. It's sugar in there. On the outside of the grape, the skin, there's yeast. Now, a little background on all of this. Yeast was shown in a couple of ways, and one of the ways it was shown in the Bible was it was sin. Remember, he said, beware of the leaven, or the yeast of the Pharisees. He says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So, with that said, sin, where was it at? It was in the skin. Now, here's the thing. When the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, did Jesus have any sin? No. He was without sin. But what he did was he turned around, he took your sin and my sin. Those of us that will come and give it to him. He's taking it upon himself. Yes, I've paid for it. But you gotta come, you gotta come give it to me. And, and guess what? This is part of the this is part of the message. This is why you come to him repentant, because as a, a repentant is because you're agreeing with him and you're saying, God, I sinned, I sinned against your word, I sinned against you. You are your word. Guess what? Save me. And he says, I'll take it. I paid for it. And there's and so guess what happens? When they would walk on these grapes, the sugar would mix with the yeast. If you know anything about, matter of fact, when I make bread, I have to proof the yeast. 
So you put a little sugar in some warm water and you put your yeast in and then it blooms. It just starts to grow. This is very interesting because even in, in winemaking, the skin had the yeast. But guess what? Jesus had no sin. So when he was on the cross, what was he doing? He took your sin and my sin upon him on his what? His flesh. So when he was crushed, when he was crucified, the sweetness of God mixed. And guess what? It paid for the sin that you had, but it made a new wine. It made a wine that, guess what? It dyed his garments red. Now, you got to keep, keep, follow me with this because God is saying, we got to meet him at the wine press. We got to know what he's done for us. Once we know what he's done for us, you'll understand something else that was taking place here uh, with Gideon. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Now, when they crushed the grapes, the wine vat, there was a place where the, where the juice would begin to run down. And do you know what's interesting? The way they had to separate the skins of the grapes, the, the, the wine, the juice itself would run down and they would use thorns and things like that in this vat. So when the juice ran down, the skins and things would get caught in the thorns. Isn't it interesting that there was a crown of thorns upon my Savior's head? There was blood that was running down. You see, it's time for us to filter the thinking. The fleshly thinking, the sinful thinking has to be what? Filtered. We've got to remove this fleshly thinking so that we can put on the mind of Christ. Once we put on the mind of Christ, how dare us even look him in the eye and say, I don't know if you can do this or not, Lord. See, the Israelites could not believe, they could not believe that God would really be able to do what he said he did because he had already been doing this with the Egyptians. He freed them from Egyptians. So he's meeting, this angel of the Lord is meeting Gideon at a wine press, but he's doing something very peculiar. Now, now once that wine had went through the vat, and it was filtered by the thorns, hallelujah, guess what? That wine would sit up, and it would turn into wine, and guess how long it would take? Three to five days is how long it takes for wine to begin to be formed, the fermentation. It would be wine within three days. How many days was Jesus in the ground, in the grave? Three days. When he's resurrected, what's interesting is there was a new wine. There was this new covenant. Isn't it interesting that, that Peter and the apostles, when they began to be filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak in other tongues, other languages that they did not know, that the people said that they were drunk with new wine. Oh, do you see all these beautiful pictures? All right, let's go back to, to Judges here. Judges 6. I want you to see this. He's near the wine press, and that's where we got to meet God at. We got to filter that thinking with the thorns. It, we got to put on the mind of Christ. It's got to catch all those fleshly thoughts and things that, that say everything but God is, is able. So watch this. He's threshing wheat. Now, do you know what that means when they thresh wheat? So they'll have the whole stock of wheat and, and the wheat kernels are there. But they don't just grind everything up. So what they do is they literally beat the wheat. Some people actually step and stomp on it for the seed to be released. Then what they do when they thresh this wheat, they throw up this, this, this stalks and the seed, which is, is heavy, it's, it goes down. Once it goes down, the wind picks up and it'll blow like they do it when it's a windy day. They'll, they'll do that or they'll have somebody fanning it so that when you're throwing this stuff, the seed will go down, but the chaff will be removed. We got to meet God at a wine press to understand his sacrifice and his ability and what he's already done. We've got to filter this thinking of ours. And then guess what? We maybe have been in sin. We may have been in things that there have been a beating that we have been taking. But all he's trying to do is separate the, the chaff from his seed. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying or not. But the seed has got to be separated from the stalk. The stalk is not, not what anyone is after. They're after the seed. God is looking for the seed of his word in you. If you're born again, and the way you're being able to be born again is simply because what has he done? He's already gone to the wine press. He's already trodden down 
and there's a new wine that's been made. He's taken your sin and my sin upon himself. And guess what? Now it's he's crushed it. He's trampled it. And the, and the wine, that grape juice, it begins to flow. It's mixed in with the skin, which has yeast in it. It's flowing down this vat. But there's thorns which catch all of those skins and all of these other things. And guess what? It's the pure juice now that flows down into a vat. And that vat begins to ferment. And it turns into a new wine. Once this this happens, we have got a choice to make because we have given God our sin and he has placed uh, all of this punishment upon this flesh and blood that he has brought to this earth intentionally for this to change our mindset, to get us out of the mindset of a victim, to get us out of a mindset of fear and to give us new life, to give us new hope. And now there may be a beating that takes place because he's wanting to separate the seed of the word of God from your flesh. Now, with this said, watch what happens. I want you to see this. This is kind of long, so I'm, I, I just pray, just, just go with me uh, on this. Uh, it says this in verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Isn't that amazing? He said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man, of, mighty man of valor. Wait a minute. He's hiding because the Midianites, the Amalekites, they keep coming and taking everything that they have. All their, their sheep, their ox, their, their cattle. They take all of their food. They, take every, they just strip them down naked. They don't have nothing. And they let them, then they'll come back later again. Once they start building everything back up, they'll come back and then they'll take it again. And this has gone on for seven years. And what is Midian doing? I mean, uh, uh, Gideon doing? He's hiding near a wine press and he's threshing wheat. He's beating this wheat. And what is he doing? So he can get his own food. You can say he's making his Wheaties. Watch this. He is hiding. How would you consider anybody to be a mighty man, a valor, a brave man that's sitting there and he's hiding? Look at this. And the angel of the Lord appeared, verse 12, unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now watch this. This is, this, is where, this is where you and I are at today. Watch this. Because a lot of people say, man, everything going on in the world and this and that. Where's God at? Watch what Gideon says. Gideon, Gideon could be in 2020. Gideon could be in this 20th century. He could be here. Watch what he asks. In verse 13, <clears throat> and Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? What's he talking about? Seven years of being in bondage to the Midianites and the Melechites where they come and take what they want. He says, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Who forsook them? God has. Guess who's at fault? God. A lot of people are blaming God for so many things. But what did it say at the beginning of this chapter? That they went and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. What did they do? They got, they got Baal, Baal. They've got him that they're worshiping. Many of them are worshiping him. They're not worshiping God. They don't even remember or acknowledge that God brought them out of Egypt. That's why we got to meet him at the wine press. You got to go back. To when you heard the gospel, you got to go back and understand, I delivered you. I bought you. I paid a price for you. And then guess what? This beating that's going on that you're getting, I'm trying to separate the seed of the word of God so that you can do something. See, God is saying, listen, it's time to go to war. Once you've obeyed the gospel, you've repented, you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you receive the Holy Ghost, guess what? You become a new creature. When you become a new creature, you have a new covering. The new covering that you have is the word of God because he came here in the flesh. The word was made flesh. When you become one with God, this is, um, this is why it shook me so. When, last Sunday when I pulled up at, at a brother's house and he said, you have become one with the word of God, now use it. See, the, the, the body I'm living in, yes, this body is flesh. It's going to go back to the dirt. It's going to go back to the ground. And this body here, it fights against the things of, of God. This mind here, it fights against the things of God. The Bible said that, <clears throat> says, whatever you ask in my name and doubt not, I'll do it. What? So what makes people not pray? What people? They don't believe. 
We have a heart of unbelief and God said, root it out. Have faith. It is impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Did you know that even just praying for your food, that, that guess what? With, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Guess what? Whatsoever is not of faith is a sin. Did you know that? Just praying. How many of you have, have just loosely prayed for the food and you're asking God to bless and sanctify you? Yeah, Lord, bless in Jesus' name. Okay, amen. But let's eat. But there's no faith involved. Whatsoever is not of faith is a sin. Every day that you get up, if you're not living, to, living unto God by faith, you are sinning before him. He's, you wonder why you're taking a beating. He's trying to separate the word from you so that it will drop down. It can plant. It can be used of him. So he's, here's Gideon. He's asking. He said, well, if God's for us, he said, why is all this stuff happening to us? Why? Watch the answer of the angel. The angel of the Lord. This is, this is an angel of God's presence. The angel of the Lord. This is the angel of his presence. And he says, uh, and the Lord looked upon him, verse 14, and said, go in this thy might. Thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Now, wait a minute. He says, go in this thy might. Why is he telling? This man is scared. He's threshing wheat by a wine press. He's trying to hide this from the Midianites. And he's being told that, guess what? He is a mighty man of valor. But yet then he wants to know, God, what, what, if you're with us, then where, where's all this happening? Where, what are we supposed to do? Oh, my God. And what's interesting is he says, go this in thy might. Why? They've already had a meeting at the wine press. This wine press is where, guess what? It was a representation of what, what God would do. God was going to do what? This was prophetic. He said in Isaiah 63, 3, he said that he had tread the wine press alone. He said his garments had been dyed, they were blood red. Basically, he, he, he died. He's, he's, his blood is all over him. When they, when they whipped him, when they crucified him, he had the crown of thorns. All of these things, you see these pictures, even the wine press, how that the thorns had to be in there to catch the skins of the grapes as they began to flow down to separate the juice from the skins so that the wine would then ferment. All these amazing pictures. God is expecting this. Now, so watch this. Gideon, I'm not going to go into all of this about the fleece. If you've read Judges, you know Gideon's story. He's, he's like, man, I don't know, Lord. Tell me, you know, show me. And then God gives him some, uh, the angel of the Lord tells him what to do uh, as far as taking down the altar of Baal and this and that. And some of these things happened. And, and when they happened, all, the, all these things happened. When they happened, he did it even at night. Why? Because he was scared. He was scared. He was still in fear. Even when God says, you're going to save the people, he was still in fear. It's amazing. It's amazing that he was still in fear. Now, I want you to see what comes up on, on, uh, on Gideon. Gideon has some, some issues with God, and guess what? God says, that's okay. We're going to work with it. We're going to work with it. So watch this. If you, uh, when we go, I'm going to just kind of fast forward through some of this. Once we get to chapter 7 in Judges, I want you to see something. And the Lord said unto, the, unto Gideon, because Gideon calls all these people to go to war. The people are sick and tired too, but watch this. He says, he calls all the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand has saved me. So there was, there was over 30,000 people that show up, over 30,000. But they're fighting against a group that says they fill the land like grasshoppers. They're outnumbered way, way, way. There's too many people. But notice what God says. See, many of us think, well, really, there's just not enough people that really believe God. There's not really enough people that actually hold to the Bible anymore. That's okay. That's okay. There's so many people today that don't really believe. That's okay. The fewer, the better. You know why? Because God is going to use the few to reach the many. Just watch what happens here. So God says, hey, there's too many Israelites for me to deliver the Midianites into your hands. Watch this. Now, there, verse 3, chapter 7, verse 3. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And they returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained only 10,000. So there's over 30,000 people. He said, hey, look, if you're scared, you can go home. 22,000 people said, Psh, we're out. Leaves them with just 10,000, a little over 10,000. 
At least they were honest, right? 22,000 said, man, we, psh, bye, we're out. 10,000, and guess what? And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. 10,000 versus a land filled with people. He said, there's still too many people. So let me tell you what happens. He, what does he do? He begins to separate the people. And he separates the people because, and I'm, I'm fast forwarding here, but what does he do? All those that went down to the water, and guess where he separated them at? He separated them at the water. See, God still uses water to separate his people. People don't know that. You see, the Bible says, and in every account of it in the Bible, when it comes to baptism, has always been done in the name of Jesus Christ. But guess what? The predominant way today that people will baptize, they say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The majority of quote-unquote Christendom does this. However, none of the apostles, none of the disciples, no one ever did this. I challenge you, look in the Bible. In the, in the book, guess what? No one was ever done. Everyone was, was baptized in the name of Jesus. There has been a separation at the water. Why? The Bible says there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. So people, they, they, get, they say this, well, no, 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 but, but Jesus said, go ye therefore teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, all of those same people that were there, because in Matthew 28, 19, he spent 40 days teaching things, it says in Acts chapter 1, things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And when the Jewish people heard that they killed their Messiah in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, the, the people said, men and brethren, what should we do? They were convicted. They wanted to know what do we need to do? And then Peter said, because all the apostles were there were with him, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, that means the payment, of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. And then, it's, and then it says, and this promises unto you, your children, is, and as far, as, as far off as many as our Lord God shall call. So when was that going to stop? It never did. Some people say, but, but he, Jesus himself said, Father, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Watch this. Jesus also said, I have come in my Father's name. What's the name of the Son? See, that's why he was called Emmanuel. This was the great mystery, that God himself would come. This is why it was talking in Isaiah 63, which I was reading to you, that he tread the winepress alone. What was he doing? His garments were red. So now all these people are being separated at the water. Only 300 people. And you know what? The Bible talks about that. He says his people are peculiar people. You know what peculiar means? That's a real nice way of saying strange, weird. And guess what? God used 300 people. Watch this. He uses 300 people to do what? To go to battle. I'm going to keep fast forwarding here with Gideon. And Gideon, you know, I, the, the whole thing with the fleece, he had told God, he said, look, don't be mad at me now. He said, look, I'm going to put some fleece out on the, on, the, on the ground, and in the morning I want all the, the ground to be wet, but the fleece to be dry from the dew. He gets out. Guess what? All the ground was wet. The fleece was dry. Wow. Then he said, no, no, don't be angry with me, Lord. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now let's do it the opposite. I want the whole ground to be dry, but I want the fleece to have the dew in it, be, be wet. Once he get up, the ground, guess what? He wrings out the fleece. It's a miracle. He still doesn't believe God. He still does not believe God. And so guess what? God has to tell him something. God tells him, uh, let, let's go to uh, Judges chapter 7, verse 9. It says, uh, it says in, in verse 9, it says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thy hand. But if thou fear, which that's the whole point here, He's been doing this. But if thou fear to go down, go with Fura, thy servant, down to the host. Now watch this. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Fura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of Israel east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for the multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside of a multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream, watch this, unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it and fell and overturned it 
that the tent lay alone. Now watch this. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into the hand of the host of Midian. Now wait a minute. Who had already told him? You help me out. God had already told him very early on. He had told him something. You know what he told him? He says, he says you're going to deliver Israel from the Midianites. He said, I'm not going to do this. I'm the least in my family. God said it. That's his word. God's word has all, is always being doubted. Notice that God even did the fleece thing with him. He, he's keeping his word the whole time. He's keeping his word. The fleece was wet one day. The fleece was dry on the ground. It was the opposite with the ground. And guess what? He still had, and then God says, look, if you're still afraid, I want you to go and to the enemy's camp. When he goes to the enemy's camp, what is he hearing? Somebody has a weird dream. You know what the weird of the dream is? It says there was a barley cake that just rolled down from this, this hill, this mountain, and it hits a tent and knocks the tent over. And they said, this is none other than, than Gideon. God has given the Midianites into the hand of Gideon. Wait a minute, that sure is a heck of an interpretation, but you know who put that dream there? God did. Who was Gideon? They didn't even know. Man, Gideon's over here hiding, threshing wheat. Isn't it amazing? And guess what? Now here's some more revelation here. Notice it was bread that came from above. The bread that came from above, it comes down this mountainside and it hits the tent and it destroys, it annihilates the enemy. Let, let me help you out here. Jesus Christ said that he is the bread that came down from heaven. He is the bread, the unleavened bread with no sin. And guess what he's come to do? He's destroyed the work of the enemy. So that what? We can have victory. This is why he was angry with the Israelites. Seven years, seven years, they are in bondage to the Midianites because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Why? They doubted his word. And number two, you know what else they did? They were having other gods. They didn't believe in what God could do. And he said that. He even sends a prophet to them to tell them this. And he says, look, you didn't believe me. You didn't believe my word. And even now, Gideon's having problems with the word of God. I'm here to tell you, don't look around and start thinking, man, if I was in those days, that would have never happened to me. I would have believed. Yeah, you know why? Because you've read the whole story. You know the end and what happens. And you, you say that, but how are you doing right now in this pandemic? How are you doing right now if you're in the United States with this election? How are you doing right now with your family and what's going on? How are you doing right now? And guess what? The Bible says he's already declared the end from the beginning. We already know. We have the word of God here and we know that we become, we're victorious. We're more than conquerors through him that saved us. Isn't it amazing? And, and what are we doing? Are we, are we conquered or are we conquerors? That's what's interesting. So this barley cake rolls from, from on high, from out of the mountain, hits a tent and knocks it over. Why? Because we are all in tents. We're tabernacling around on this, on this earth. Jesus himself, he was mentioned to be as a tabernacle. He was, he was the Ark of the Covenant. He was all these pictures that he was. But he was also the bread from heaven that came down to do one thing, and that was to destroy the works of the devil and to save us. Now, I'm not done yet. Watch this. Now, keep in mind, remember, I said about the wine press that God was going to, he was going to tread the grapes alone is what he said, and his garments were dyed, they were red. All right, I want you to see how they get, how they win against the Midianites and the Amalekites that are here. Watch this. Uh, so, Gideon's, Gideon's, and notice this, and Gideon is encouraged not by what God had said, but what, what, what the enemy said. Still, add insult to injury, but God knew it. He said, if you're still afraid, go down with your servant. Go down and hear what the enemy says about you. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? God was so patient with Gideon. He was patient with him. And guess what? He still doubted the word of God. But whose word did he believe? He believed the enemy. 
God had to give a dream and an interpretation of a vision to the enemy so that Gideon could believe. My God, when will we take the word of God for what it says? When will we adhere to the word of God and say, God, you said it. That settles it, and I believe it. God is looking for those kind of soldiers that when they hear the word of God, they say, I take it. I believe it. Let's go. That's what separated last week when we were talking about this with Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb came back. They saw the promised land. They saw all these other things. They saw the giants. They saw all the same things that the other people saw, but they said, God can deliver them in their hands. Let's go. Let's go to war right now. Let's go. And 10 of them said, nope. They were afraid. What are you afraid of? What exactly are you afraid of? And what has the word said already? This is a time for war. It's this, I mean, there's so many distractions that are going on right now. And with this said, God himself is saying, will you trust my word? Will you become one with my word? The way you become one with his word in marriage is by the gospel. Repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus, and the baptism in the name of Jesus, it says it's for the payment. In Acts 22, when Ananias was talking to Saul, he told Saul, who was going to be called Paul, he says, when he hears him and he tells him the, the, the message, he said, Paul, why are you, why tarry? Why are you waiting? Why are you wasting time? He said, arise and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why? Because Paul was going to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And what was he going to do? He was going to be calling on the name of Jesus. This is why it says in Romans 10 that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not just saying, Jesus. That's not it. It was in obeying the gospel, which is when you come to an understanding that you need to die. You need to die to yourself. You need to become guilty before God and repentant. When you repent, you're, you're sorry for what you've done. And then when you're dead, blood is applied. But you've got to be buried. And you're buried in the name of Jesus for the washing away and the remission or the payment of your sins. Why? Somebody's name has got to be on it because it says, guess what? And there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. What name is that? The name of Jesus. So what do you think Satan would do? He would fight against what? The very name of Jesus. And then he says, you'll receive the Holy Ghost. So this is all the same elements that are in a physical birth. A child will what? They, there's, when they're being born, there's a bloody show. So there's blood that's present. They, the water breaks on the, the womb. Guess what? The, the, the child comes out in, in this amniotic fluid. And then they have to breathe or it's a stillborn. Nothing's changed. All right. So watch this. I want you to see the battle plan because there's something beautiful in all of this. Stay with me, okay? And so... Um, after verse 15 of chapter 7 of Judges. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, he worshiped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Watch this. And he divided 300 men. So how many men are going to be used to God? They went from over 30,000 to 10,000 to now down to 300. And where were they separated at? They were separated at the water. Just like today, people that are being separated to God, they're getting separated at the water. It's in the name of Jesus' baptism. Watch this. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. He put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And Gideon said, and so Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch and they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And three and the three companies blew the trumpets, break the pitchers, and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, let's, let's get this whole picture here together. Gideon's given them all trumpets. They all have trumpets. They also have these earthen pitchers. What's inside the earthen pitcher? It's a lamp. What is a lamp? Not a candle. It's a lamp. So these lamps are able to continue burning, so they have oil. I want you to look at all of the, the pictures here. There's a trumpet, so there's going to be a sound made. 
And so uh, we know that even there's salvation mentioned even in how the, the trumpet, uh, what it represents, especially being from an animal's horn and so forth. I'm not going to get into that right now, but guess what? It, it deals with, with God basically saving us. So here's this trumpet. Now keep in mind, so when you're blowing a trumpet, can you imagine a kid learning to play the trumpet at the house? What is it? It's like, oh God, man, that's it's really noisy, right? So keep this mind in mind. They blow the trumpet, but inside these earthen pitchers, there is a lamp inside the pitcher. That lamp has to have oil that's feeding. It's being wicked up. There's oil that is feeding, and it's, there's a flame. Now, how effective is the light inside the lamp? I mean, the lamp inside of this earthen vessel. You can't see it. It's hard to see. Now, there's 300 people. I want you to see. Watch this. He blows with the trumpet. All the other people. They surround. They got three companies of 100 each, 300 men. They're blowing their trumpets. Then they break the earthen vessel. What's left in the earthen vessel? The lamp. This little light of mine. I'm going to... Guess what? It's not even your little light. It's the light of God. You see, that earthen vessel... That earthen vessel had to be broken. Do you know what you need to be? You need to be broken. See, the, the, life of, the, the light of God cannot be seen in your earthen vessel until you're broken. There has to be a blowing of the trumpet. And when this happened, what happened? There's all this commotion. There's the noise of the trumpets. There's a breaking of these earthen vessels. And now there's a light. And what does it do? It says in verse 21, And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord said, Every man soared against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Bethshedah and Zarethah, and to the border of uh, Abel, Meholah, and Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of Manasseh, and, pers and pursued after the Midianites. Where did they go? Out of Naphtali? Look at this. Remember this. All this is going to come back to you. You're going to see it. And you're going to be like, wow, i never seen this. Or maybe you have. But Naphtali, look, Manasseh, Midianites, look. Now watch. This is, this is what I want you to see the end of, of, of their captors. Watch what happens. <laughs> it says, and Gideon sent messengers throughout all of Mount Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and take before all them the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. Now watch this. And they took the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock. Oreb. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. On the other side of Jordan. There's a lot of pictures here. Where did the two leaders get killed? One got killed upon a rock. And the other one got killed at the wine press. What is this? Because there is a chief cornerstone and his name is Jesus. And he was rejected. But guess what? This, this king was slown, slewn. He was killed at what? A rock. The other one was killed at a wine press. What did they say in Isaiah 63? I tread the wine press alone. He did it alone. Guess what? He defeated the enemies. When they blew the trumpet, when they broke the earthen vessels and the, the light was shining, they attacked each other. The Israelites didn't attack them. Then they just went and chased them down. Now, with all that said, I'm going to read, I'm going to read a very familiar passage to you now. Keep in mind all of what we just got through looking at. Go to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. God said, it's time for war. It is time for war. It's time for you to believe my word. It's time for you to, if you, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, it's time for you to obey the gospel and become one with the word. Watch this. It says, for, uh, verse 1, Isaiah chapter 9. Watch this. Watch this. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as such was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, the land Naphtali. Watch this. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness, watch this, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Remember the breaking of the, the pictures? Watch this. They have seen a great light. This is also prophetic of Jesus coming. Watch this. They have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them that have 
hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy, the joy before thee according to the joy and harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. This is talking about Gideon's day. Watch this. Now watch this. Watch the battle. Watch this. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and with fuel of fire. Confused noise, garments that are dipped in red, they're rolled in blood. This is because we have become one with our God. We become one with Him. And guess what? The battle is with confused noise. Guess what? When they, begin, when they obeyed the gospel... When they had repented, when they had been baptized in the name of Jesus, he sends down the Holy Ghost and what happens? He fills them and people are laughing at the, the, the disciples and the people that are following because they begin to speak in tongues. They're making a bunch of noise. And what do they say? They say these people are not. This is not something special. They're just drunk with new wine. How is it that they could be drunk with new wine? Well, Jesus, who was at the wine press, who crushed and walked upon the grapes, then when it went through the filter of the thorns, and it, then the juice ran down into a vat, and after three days it became wine. There was a new wine that was there, and that new wine was the testament that he's given, and he fills us now with his spirit and there is a confused noise to the enemy when you speak in the Holy Ghost when you speak in tongues hallelujah once you've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ then what happens there is a confused noise there is a battle and I'm telling you now Satan is it afraid that if his people which are called by his name that's the name of Jesus if we'll wake up if we'll be beaten and that the separate the chaff from the seed of the word of God, then the word of God can take root and we can go and produce fruit. I'm here to tell you, watch what it says. Now watch, watch, watch. It said in verse 5, for every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Now watch this one. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with the, with the justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This battle is coming and it says, look, it's going to be with confused noise. It's going to be all of this. And then what does it say? For unto us a child, a child is what? Is born. Unto us a son is given. This is prophetic of Jesus. Why? Because just like in, in, in Gideon's day, they had been taken over. They had been ransacked. The Midianites, the Amalekites that came in. Guess what? There is a fight. How much fight is left in you? Have your garments been dipped and rolled in the blood? If they haven't, and then guess what? If you, if you don't have your trumpet, if you don't have your trumpet to blow, my God is this. you got to be filled with the Spirit of God. You know how many churches today don't even teach that? Think about that. Do you think Satan wants you to have the Spirit of God? No. Do you know, watch this. I'm just going to show you how much, there are certain translations, even of the Bible, they're, they're actually uh, copyrighted, like the NIV. I call it, and I've heard it used, it's not original with me, but the NIV, the New International Version, the nearly inspired version. Do you know there are multiple passages and verses that have been taken out of that Bible? One of them, one of the key things is this. It says in that particular, in that particular version, or doesn't say, when, when there was a man that had brought his son to the disciples because he had demons. And, and he says, I brought them to your disciples and they couldn't cast out the devils. He said, if thou can do anything, he said, can, can you have mercy? And he says, can you believe? Now, after he cast out the devil out of, his, out of his, this man's son, then guess what? The disciples come and said, Lord, how come we couldn't cast out those devils? He said, 
This kind doesn't go out but without prayer and fasting. Isn't it interesting that that would be taken out of that particular, that particular version of the Bible? Why? I'm telling you, that, that word was under attack. Why? Because when the people of God begin to fast, when the people of God begin to pray, it doesn't make you more powerful. What it does is it lines you up with God because flesh is what's in the way with serving God. No flesh will glory in his presence. I'm just here to tell you, you've got to have, you have got to have the gospel in your life. Now, what is the gospel? There's a lot of people out there preaching all kinds of things. And guess what? I'm here to tell you all I can do is give you the word of God. The word of God tells us about salvation. And I'm going to do, I've been doing this just about every week now. I want you to hear this in, in uh, the book of Acts. I want you to, I'm going to, I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read to you what they did when they heard that they crucified their Messiah. This was the Jewish people. They crucified their Messiah. And they asked, what shall we do? They were in trouble. They knew they were in trouble. You can imagine, you kill your own, your own Savior, your own Messiah. And when we get to, to verse 37, Peter had been telling them what they had done. Watch in verse 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? How do we get saved? How do we get out of this position, this situation that we're in? Now, I'm going to read it to you from black and white right here. You listen and you see if you did it. You know. Then Peter said, this is verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the payment, for the payment of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How long is it for? For the, the promise. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That means today. How many of you can say you did this? How many of you can say you've received the Holy Ghost? How many of you are probably thinking, you know what, well, I said a prayer. I did say a prayer. Did it say anything about a prayer here? No. Did he say anything in here? Did you hear anything where it says, come into my heart? No. Where did that come from? It came from the pits of hell. Nowhere in the Bible did anybody do that. Nowhere. All the examples that have been given have been people that have come, they've been repentant, they agree with God that they're sinful, and they, repentance brings death. Because the soul that sins shall surely die. You know what happens when you come into this knowledge and understanding that you have sinned against God? You know what you do? You repent. You're saying, God, I agree with you. I deserve death. As soon as that happens, blood is applied. Then you're dead. But you've got to be born again. Your first birth, there was blood, water, and spirit at that birth. So watch what happens. When this happens, you die, you repent, you got to be buried. That's what we do with people when they die. But you're buried in a name. You're buried in the name of Jesus. Why? For the remission, for the payment of your sins. So my question is this. If, that's what, if it's for the payment of your sins, so just a real dumb question. What happens if you decide, I'm not going to get baptized in Jesus' name? then there's no payment for your sins. Oh, brother, well, you're teaching works. That means that's what it is. You're teaching. You believe that you can save yourself. I've never seen a dead person bury themselves. Stop following tradition. Start following the word. Even Gideon in his day said, where be all the miracles and this and this and that? And why did the people, why was it that the people... In, in, Midian's, in uh, Gideon's day, why were they crying out to God? They were crying out to God because they were afflicted of the Midianites. They were not crying out to God because of their sin. Because they had thrown God off. They, weren't, they were not crying out to God for that. They were like, woe is me. Because for seven years, for seven years, guess what happened? The Midianites came and took everything they had. You know what? I'm going to just talk to the church right now.
Those of you that have this belief and understanding in the Word of God, I'm here to tell you, you're saying the church is afflicted, the church is this. Guess what? It's time to put the devil on the run. It's time not to say, woe is the church, but it's time for the church to look to God and say, we repent. We repent because guess what? We didn't believe what your word said, but I'm going to, I believe it now. I'm going to stand with the word of God and everything it says. I don't have to hear the devil tell me what my position is in God. I'm going to take the word of God for what it says. So this is why when I heard that word come to me and I was pulling outside of Brother Caesar's house and he says, you have become one with the word of God. Now use it. It was a very forceful move, a word that came to me and I trembled. I was, I was shaken because the word of God has got to be used. The word of God is angry. He is very angry because we have allowed things to go on and yet we have become one with the word of God. Let me tell you something. It's time to start speaking. We, we see all the things, everything you see that's going on in the world today, there's a spiritual implication behind it. And we have to fight spiritually. We have to fight against what? The principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness in high places. This is where our battle is. It's not with your neighbor. It's not with your, with your family. It's not with your friends. It's not with your coworkers. These are all physical manifestations of what's going on in the supernatural. I'm here to tell you, God says, you're going to be rejected. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be talked all about. People are going to say all kinds of false things about you. But he says, that's what they did with me. I'm, I'm letting you get beat. Just like, just like uh, Gideon was threshing the, the wheat. There was a beating taking place because that beating was doing what? There was a separation of the seed. Church. Begin to embrace, embrace the disgrace, embrace the punishment, embrace the rejection, embrace being made fun of, embrace all of these things because it is as a result of the seed of the word of God. And with that seed of the word of God comes something very powerful, and that is promise. The Bible says all the promises of God are in him, yea, and amen. So if you're in Christ, there should be tribulation. If you're in Christ, there should be rejection. If you're in Christ, there should be a beating. Because guess what? There's something else that's going to come with it, and that is the supernatural. God will not... He said that this, the battle is with, with noise, confused noise, garments rolled in blood. Guess what? That's us. If you've obeyed the gospel, that's us. Now, you that's watching, that said, I've accepted Jesus. You that has said, I've said this prayer. There's nowhere in the Bible. I challenge anyone. Anyone, I, I'll even do an open debate with you on that. Show me, show me from the word of God where someone said the sinner's prayer. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and just, there's none there. I'll save you the trouble. There's none. If you tell me about the man that was on the cross with Jesus, the thief on the cross, he wasn't saying, enter my heart. I asked somebody, a relative here just this, this recently, I asked him, I said, how do you get into Christ? Oh, well, when I, I ask them into my heart, I said, okay, well, that's, that's your understanding. And you've asked them into your heart. That's, but there's nowhere in the Bible that even mentions that. I said, how do you get into Christ? Well, I told you, I ask them into my that's, that's him, according to you, coming into you. I said, how do you get into him? Well, well I, I don't know. I said, well, keep this in mind. It says that if you're not in him, because he says you've got to be rooted and built up in him. It says that if you're not in Christ, then you're a bastard. You're a foreigner. You're an alien. You're outside of him. You're outside of, if it was Noah's day, you're outside of the ark. But the Bible says in Galatians 3, 27, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It tells you right there how you get in Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ. Why does he say into Christ? Because you're being baptized into a who, not into a title. You're being baptized into a name because there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And the devil will fight it. The devil has been fighting the word of God since day one. And when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, it brought with it a name, and that name was Jesus. And when that name came, so came salvation. So now Satan fights the word, but even more so, 
the word that was made flesh, which is Jesus, and he can't stand it. Don't let Satan trick you. Don't, don't let the traditions of this world cause you to miss the greatest thing that's ever been done for humanity, which is salvation, which is allowing us to become one with him, allowing us to become, there's all these pictures, we become married to him, we become his heir, we become his children. He's given unto us, it says in John 1, the power to become the sons of God, not by flesh and blood. No, not by flesh and blood from here because it was his flesh and blood. It was the word that was made flesh. There's a mystery behind that. Even in the garden, when they sinned, they covered themselves with fig leaves. Were they naked? No, not anymore. They put on fig leaves. But what did the fig leaves do for sin? Fig leaves don't have blood. So it says that God did what? He clothed them with skins of an animal. Why? How could you do that? A skin from an animal means an innocent animal had to die. And he clothed them. This is why when Jesus came, when John saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. How does he take away the sin of the world? The Lamb of God, Emmanuel, Jesus, he was coming to do what? Die. But then he was going to clothe us with what? His body. The Word of God. Death would be swallowed up. The death sentence that's in this body would be swallowed up. And now we have a house not made with hands. It was his body. He's building a temple. There's all these pictures. As, as you are born again and you've obeyed the gospel, you become, we're living stones. He's creating. He's putting these things together. He's a master builder. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone there's so many pictures in the word of God and yet today there's so much fluff from the pulpits there's so much there's, the, the word is not being preached like it needs to be because people are preaching this, this word as if it's powerless people have changed the truth of God the power of God for a lie they love the lie more than they did the truth you got to have a love for the truth of God so with that said, I want to just, I want to urge you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. I want to pray for you in the name of Jesus. If you have not obeyed the gospel, you've got to obey the gospel. What is it? The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, how can I die? How can I be buried like Jesus did? The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. In the life that I live, I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Guess what? So I'm dying. How do I die? Probably one of the hardest things that ever has to happen is you've got to agree that you were wrong. Do you know most people have a hard time doing that? Most people cannot be wrong. That's the flesh. I can't be wrong. It's pride. you got to be wrong. you got to say, well, you know what? Number one, you got to believe this, the, the Word of God. Do you believe it? If you believe it and you say, yeah, that, that's, that is an anointed book. And when I read it according to that book and I believe it, I've done you wrong, God. And guess what I need to do? I agree with you, so I'm wrong. The Bible says the soul that sins shall surely die. You know what you're doing now? You're saying, I want to die now. What do you mean I want to die now? I deserve death. But I don't want to die later on. I want to die now. And God says, that's the first step. That's repentance. So you're dying. You're dying to you. You're dying to your way. And then what are you doing? You're, now that you're dead, guess what? Blood is applied. The blood of Jesus is applied to you because you're agreeing with this word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. You are now being covered by the blood of Jesus. What's interesting is then it's time to be buried. And that's why you go to a grave and the and baptism, not sprinkling. That's not a grave. You go to a watery grave. When you go to this watery grave, you're going to be put down in burial. And there's something that happens when you go down in the water in burial. It says in Colossians chapter 2 that there's a circumcision. It's an operation of God, not made with hands. He does what? He cuts away what? this body 
Why is he cutting away this body? Because this, it's the body of sins, it calls it. That's where sin goes. So you're, you're going down in the name of Jesus Christ for the payment of your sins after you've repented. And then he cuts away your sinful flesh and he clothes you with the word of God. Now you've got to have his spirit and he fills you with his spirit. See, he's giving you a new covering because you can't put new wine into old wine skins. This can't handle it. This is why you have to have a new covering. And when he fills you with his spirit, guess what? The very first thing that he does, do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that people have tamed all kinds of beasts and animals and everything else. True. There's only one thing that has never been tamed. You know what that is? The tongue. It says the tongue is so evil even on a massive ship, it has like a little rudder, little bitty thing, and it turns this way. It just moves to the left, to the right, and guess what? It doesn't take much, and guess what? It causes the whole ship to move. The first thing he does when he fills you with his spirit, you know what he takes charge of? Your tongue. And you begin to speak in another language. I'll never forget being in a, in a service and there was a, a brother, Brother Rene, that was there. He was, uh, he, he doesn't speak any English. Praise God. Love the brother. And I'll never forget, I was, I, was, I was praying in the spirit. I was praying at the altar. And I'm hearing somebody, and this was at a Spanish church. And uh, I'm hearing this. It said, oh, Lord, you're so beautiful. I mean, like, I mean, it's like, I'm like, okay. I'm just, I just, when I'm coming out of prayer, I'm hearing this. And I look up, and guess who it is that's praying? It's, it's Brother Rene. Well, he's a pastor now, Pastor Rene. He was speaking in perfect English, and he, he doesn't speak English. But God had taken his tongue, and he was, he was praising God with that tongue. Hallelujah. You've got to be born again. And part of being born again is acknowledging your sin toward God and dying, being buried, baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission or the payment of your sins and then being filled with the Holy Ghost. When this happens, there's a newness. Remember the, the noise, the confused noise? Well, guess what? Guess what? When the Spirit of God enters you and begins to flow out of you, this, this, is, this is what scares the enemy. Not because you speak in tongues. No. But that you have obeyed the gospel. And if you then understand and realize who you are in him. See, God doesn't save you a little bit and then more bit and then all the way out. And he gives you his power. All the power that God, has, he'll give it to you. The only thing that you don't have that's not full is faith. He's given unto every man the measure of faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the power of God has been given to you with his spirit, the word. But if you want to increase your faith, it's going to require you in the word of God. And then guess what? He didn't say it took a whole lot of faith. You don't need a dump truck load full of faith. He said if you have this faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, smallest seed, you can tell this mountain be cast, removed and cast into the sea. He wants you to have as much faith He's not trying to hold anything back from you. The faith of God comes through the Word of God, through the hearing of the Word of God, not the reading of the Word of God, the hearing of the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? Brothers and sisters, it's time to fight. The war is now. God is not happy with us because we have not believed His Word. And yet it is His Word that should be magnified. He said his word is forever settled in heaven. How about on earth? You know why it's not settled on earth? Because there's so many people that are in the word that guess what? We still doubt. What happens when the word of God is settled here even on the earth? When it's settled in our hearts that if it says it, I believe it. Hallelujah. That is the power of God. And this is what he's looking. He said, so I'm going to just repeat what he told me when I pulled up Brother Caesar's house. He said, you have become one with 
my word. Use it. And it shook me to my core. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. My gracious God, Lord, I thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in your precious name right now, I pray for everyone that is watching. Lord, in your name, Lord, we bind and shackle the works of the enemy, the strong man that's over those right now. As we go into warfare, as we begin to pull down the strongholds, Lord, the rulers, the princes of this, this earth, Lord, the spiritual wickedness that's in high places, these rulers, and Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bind and shackle in Jesus' name. And those that are over houses and over people, we bind and shackle those strong men. And Lord, we just pray that there would be a loosing of their hearts and minds to hear the word of God. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray for those. And those that have heard this gospel message and have not obeyed, Lord, we bind and shackle any spiritual influence that would keep them or even pride that would keep them from coming to you and, and, and following through with the gospel. Lord, we just ask that your hand, your anointing, that your angelic beings that are messengers, they would be sent. And in the name of Jesus, we give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God richly bless you and keep you until we see each other again. Amen.